Well, hello, Bread for the World. Uh, I am just humbled and honored to share a few reflections with you on your virtual advocacy summit. And, uh, you know, at the risk of being a little cliche, I'm going to use a story that's probably very familiar to, to some of you all, but this is the fish and the loaves story. Uh, it's always a little um, challenging to hear it with fresh ears, but just pretend you never heard this story before. I, I love this story, and I think it's got something to offer us, especially with your marvelous work at Bread for the World. So uh, this is Jesus, you know, story of Jesus in the Gospels. And um, it says that Jesus crossed to the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and a great crowd of people followed him there because of the miraculous signs he was performing on the sick. And so Jesus went up the mountainside and sat down uh, with the disciples. And then it says that Jesus looked up and saw the crowd coming towards him, and he said, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this just to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, eight months wages would not buy enough bread for each one of these folks to eat. Another of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up and said, here's a boy with a five small barley loaves and a couple of fish, but how far will they go among so many? And Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and the people sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed it to those who were seated as much as, uh, as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left and leave nothing wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. Now, I'm just going to stop there and say this story is in, you know, all the Gospels. There's a few little variations here and there, but there's some real beautiful wisdom, I think, for us and given your work at Bread for the World. And the first thing I love about this story is... Uh, as you read the different narratives in, in, in the various Gospels, uh, they, they, they all have a different take. But basically, Jesus notices that the people are hungry. And the disciples notice that people are hungry. And I think that's the first place to start is because we don't always notice, right? And you all notice. You notice that the, the child hunger rate in, in, in the United States is skyrocketed, you know, during this pandemic, we notice that the first thousand lives of someone's life are so important. So you notice that, you know, you know and I think noticing is part of the point of the story. And then, you know, depending on which gospel you're reading, the disciples um, say to Jesus, you need to feed these people. And they're relying totally on Jesus. And in a couple of the narratives, it's really interesting because Jesus says right back to them, you need to feed the people. And isn't that something, right? That I think sometimes we bring our concerns to Jesus and we say, why don't you do something? And Jesus throws the question right back, right? <laughs> it says, why don't you do something? And so the disciples uh, start to ask very reasonable questions, right? Like, uh, how are we going to come up with that much money, Jesus? Come on, be realistic. Like, I don't think Uber Eats makes his way out here. He ain't got no grub hub out here. You know, like, like the pizza man's not delivering here. How are we going to feed all these people? And then the, the magic of this kid, right? And I, I, I think that's part of why I thought of this story is uh, uh, because of your work, especially with, with children and with youth and, and, and hung, with hunger and poverty. And, and so this kid is the one that holds the food. And the disciples bring it to Jesus and they said, well, you know, we got this kid's lunch, a few fish and loaves and, and Jesus adds a little God stuff. Right. And it's, it's kind of this conspiracy between the, the disciples, the kid, Jesus, and, and the miracle happens and all the people eat, not only do they eat, but there there's baskets and baskets left over. And what I love about this story is that that little kid got to be a part of the miracle. Uh, the disciples got to be a part of the miracle. I think one of the biggest mysteries of our faith 
is that for some wild reason, God does not want to change the world without us. I mean, don't you, don't you think it's interesting if you go back to the desert temptations, right? One of them was to, to-, to turn the stones into bread. And there's one uh, little um, reenactment of that I saw. And in, in, uh, I'll just confess, I think it was a Jesus mini series or something back in the day. And, but what was so poignant was the temptation came from a little girl who was starving and came to Jesus and said, please, please can you turn this stone into bread so I can eat? And yet Jesus resists the temptation when it came from the devil. But maybe part of that temptation, too, I, I don't know, I'm just throwing it out there, might be to, to heal all of the problems in the world that we've helped create without our participation in the miracle. And so here we have Jesus actually doing a miracle, and we all are invited to be a part of that. So I, I think that... Uh, your work, you know, is, is living into that idea that this is a conspiracy where we are uh, the midwives of a new and better world. God is bringing the reign of God, of, of heaven on earth, and we get to participate that in that. And we know that God's dream on earth doesn't include children that are hungry. It's that every person would have this daily bread. And so that, that uh, uh, you know, my mentors have always taught me, uh, folks like John Perkins, you know, have taught me that we need to be people of prayer, but we also need to be people who are ready to get up off of our knees and become the answer to our prayers. If, if you know, week after week, our small group keeps praying for our neighbor to get a wheelchair ramp, then maybe we need to get some carpenters together and build a wheelchair ramp for them, right? And I think as you look at the world, there is something beautiful that Jesus is present in the miracle. Uh, it's not limited to the bread and fish of this little kid, but it, God is also cooperating, conspiring with us, right? To make sure folks are fed, but God wants us. God wants us to be a part of it. I think of uh, uh, the, the work of, uh, that Dr. Perkins again. One of the one of the things that he taught me. If you don't know Dr. Perkins, he's you know uh, just turned ninety years old. I got to be there for his virtual birthday, um, and he's the son of a sharecropper. His mother actually starved to death as he was being born. As as he uh, sh she was nursing him, and so he this issue of hunger has always been so important to him from the moment he was born, and. Um, uh, Dr. Perkins says, we've all heard the saying, you give someone a fish and they'll eat for a day. But you teach them to fish and they'll eat for the rest of their life. But then Dr. Perkins says, sometimes we miss the other part, though. And the other part is we've also got to ask who owns the pond. We got to do something about why there is such inequity in the world. So we do need to be giving people f fish and the relief work the, uh, you know, uh, is so important. We need to be empowering folks and t teaching folks to fish. But then we also got to ask who owns the pond. We've got to do something about the, the walls that have been put up that don't allow people access to grow and raise their own food or sometimes somebody's polluted the pond so it doesn't matter if you know how to fish if the water's polluted so all of this is the holistic work of advocacy and that's what you all are so passionate about i i can't think of you know many organizations that embody that passion for giving people fish teaching people to fish and doing something about who owns the pond as much as bread for the world. And, and I think one of the, you know, the things that we are certainly going to be judged for is, you know, in the, in Jesus's final account of the judgment in Matthew 25 is uh, my friend, Tony Campolo says, he always goes, it's not a doctrinal test in the end, according to Jesus, you know, uh, we might wish it was because we'd all probably pass a doctrinal test, but it's not that God's going to come to us and say, okay, virgin birth, agree disagree or strongly disagree, right? <laughs> but God's going to say to us, when I was hungry, did you make sure I had something to eat? 
when I, when I was thirsty, did you give me something to drink? When I was sick, did you take care of me? Did you come visit me in prison? Did you uh, welcome me when I was a stranger? That the, the real test of our faith is how it actually transa- translates into hungry people getting food. Come on, bread for the world. You can say, man, I can't hear you, but that's all right. You know what? I, I think that, uh, you know, I'm always careful to say our works don't earn our salvation. Our works demonstrate our salvation. And if in the end, our love for Jesus, our worship for God doesn't manifest itself in bread and health care and concern for those who are most vulnerable, then we might need to do a little a little check on our faith, right? We might just be worshipers of God, but not followers. And so that that's why I'm always so honored to work with you at Bread for the World. And um, and it's controversial, right? Some of this advocacy work is controversial. Everybody loves giving people fish. And nobody's going to argue with that, right? I, it was a Don Helder Camera that down in uh, Latin America who said, when I fed people, everybody called me a saint. But when I asked why people were hungry, Everybody called me a communist. <laughs> so, uh, but we've got to we've got to address the fundamental issues of hunger, you know. And I think it was Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove, my buddy, that said these days, uh, you know, when you you feed people, everybody calls you a saint. And when you ask why disproportionately children of color are the ones that are hungry, everybody says, "Oh, you're an advocate of critical race theory." So we got to get rid of all of that, right? And say, you know what? At the end of the day, my faith includes making sure folks who are hungry and addressing the the fundamental causes of poverty this inequity in a in the world right where right now less than a hundred people y'all know this better than me less than a hundred people rich people own the same amount as half of the world's population we have individuals that own more than entire countries combined so we we, we address that and we know that in the end, it's an issue of compassion, right? It's an issue of, of recognizing that, that hunger is an extension of loving my neighbor as myself. As the scripture says, how can I say I love God and see my neighbor who's in need and not have compassion on them? So this is holy work you're doing, Bread for the World. It is holy work. And I want to tell you one last story um, because I, I think it embodies the spirit of this scripture but also the work that you're doing and the hope that young people hold for us. Because I, I know that some of us are probably used to seeing young people as the folks that are in need that we're trying to advocate for. But I want to just flip that narrative in this last story. And when I was in India, uh, as some of you may know, when I was about 20 years old, I got to go to Calcutta, India, and I worked with Mother Teresa and some of the, the missionaries of charity out there. And one of the things that we saw is that there were all kinds of kids on the street that were homeless. They were starving. And many of them, Mother Teresa took in. I met this guy who was like 30 years old. And uh, he said, you know why we call, call her Mother Teresa, right? I said, well, I, I mean, tell me a little more. And he said, well, because she's our mom. She raised me. Many of us, she found, you know, abandoned in the train stations. And she, so she had this, uh, this, this life of prayer and action that were integrated, that were fleshed out, right? And so Mother Teresa saw all these kids on the street that were hungry. And she said, these kids are precious to God. When we look into their eyes, we're looking at Jesus. And Mother Teresa said, but we've got to convince them that their lives are so precious and valuable because a lot of this world is is crushing them. And so my job became like every Tuesday, we would throw a banquet feast for these kids, right? We would the, we would make a giant dinner. We'd play games and open the fire hydrants and play in the water, you know? And there was this one little kid that he told me, he came up to me one day and he told me it was his birthday. We're getting ready to start the big banquet, you know? And, and uh, it put me in a little predicament because the nuns had strict rules, you know, that you couldn't do for one. Don't play favorites. You can't get one kid a gift. You can't get for a hundred, you know, and I got all that in theory. Right. But I was like, this is kid's birthday. You know, I'd spent several weeks with him. So I just I kind of thought I'll just sneak off and get him a little birthday present. So I come back with this ice cream because I thought it's 120 degrees. Right. Got him an ice cream. And this kid gets that ice cream 
what I didn't think about is how long it might have been since he had ice cream, right? He gets this ice cream and he's just absolutely stunned. He's like, and then his impulse, his instinct is this is too good to keep for myself. And so he yells at all the other kids, right? And he goes, we've got ice cream. <laughs> he pulls them up. He lines them up. And he goes, everybody's going to get a lick. And you guys, he goes down that line. And he gives every kid a little lick of that ice cream. It's melting down his hand, you know. And he comes up to me and he goes, Shane, we saved you a lick too. I got this whole spit phobia thing. So I tried to work with that, you know, got a lick. But I, that kid knew that the, the truth of, of the gospel, right? That the best thing to do with the best things in life is to share them, to give them away. The ice cream is too good to keep for ourselves. And so I want to close with that story because I think it captures the, the what the essence of bread for the world and so much of our advocacy work, we're dealing with heavy stuff. But we've got to remember that it is love. It is joy. It is compassion. Like that little kid sharing his ice cream. That's the stuff that changes the world, right? That's the stuff that moves people's hearts. And we can't be just driven by the heaviness or the shame, but we've got to realize that this work that we're doing to make sure everybody gets a taste of the ice cream, that every little child in this world has this day their daily bread. This is the holy sacred work of God. So thank you. Thank you all at Bread for the World for all that you're doing, um, both to make sure people have bread, but also to ask why people are hungry to begin with. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm cheering you on, praying for you, and grateful for, for your holy word. So thanks for letting me share a few thoughts at the Advocacy Summit, and we'll, we'll be in touch. We're doing this together. Bless you. Let me pray for you. Let me pray for you. Oh, God. I thank you for my brothers and sisters who are noticing the hunger. They're noticing that people are hungry. And we're coming to you, Jesus, saying we've got to do something about the hunger. But we're also listening to you as you're telling us, you know, that we are your hands. We are your feet. And that we are to be a part of the story of bringing your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. So make us worthy, God, to, to follow you. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see the hunger and the hope of our children. Thank you for all that this organization has been and all that this movement and this organization is going to be in the future. Thank you for bread for the world, this little demonstration plot for your kingdom on earth. In Christ's name, amen. Mm -hmm.